ESPN's Tom Lugabell on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. What is up, Lugs? How are you? Hey, good morning, guys. How are we doing? Doing awesome. I am just now, and I think Lance is too, just now getting around to the uh, Manta Teal thing. You are all over that first <laughs> episode on Netflix. Yeah, I think I'm in it a total of like three times, twice in the first one and and, and once in the second one. I, I'll tell you, man, it's it's pretty disheartening to watch that thing, to realize, you know, just what that guy went through. You just feel like the entire planet owes him an apology, you know, and it's just a, it's a great lesson on gathering information before you release a story or try to begin a story. But uh, I thought it was really, really well done. Guy, you know, and it just sucks for him because, I mean, you were you were talking about him, obviously, in the documentary as an analyst on how good that kid was going to be. He lived up to the building. And then after he endures all that, he can't stay healthy in the NFL. It's just, you know, guy just was snake bitten. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about that to me is I thought it was really, really um, – impactful how he described he was always such a, a confident guy see ball hit ball see ball get ball and those things he never second guessed and then from that moment on everything in his life he second guessed and you're right it probably impacted his ability to play at his, his best level his highest level and then with that being said still played seven years in the national football league it's unbelievable um, this weekend, Missouri goes to Auburn, and a, a lot have been made of Auburn's loss to Penn State, um, which isn't surprising on the surface, but how bad they lost and how they are lost has seemed to sort of rattle the Auburn family, especially what they were not able to do defensively against Penn State's run game. Moving into this weekend against Missouri, um, do you think um, it's a game where Auburn can rely heavily on the run with Tank and Hunter there. And as a guy who used to call plays at the professional level, you've been in the college game, you're a quarterback. How can you go the second quarter without a guy like Tank Bigsby running, getting a one run, one run touch in the entire quarter of a game? How do you how do you lose track of that in a game? You've been there before. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, he's your best offensive player. How is he not on the field um, until he wants to come off the field? Obviously, you got to manage touches. you got to have rotation. Um, that, that's clearly a slip up on the sideline, uh, whether it's the running backs coach or the graduate assistant that's charting those things needs to alert the coach. Hey, this is where we're at on our touch chart. Um, that, that's inexcusable. Um, if you guys remember last week when I was talking about Penn state, cause I had just seen him that it was so important. If Auburn was going to have to have an advantage, it would have to come from the defensive line because they don't have an advantage at quarterback. And then they weren't able to, to manufacture that. And, we saw what Nick Singleton did on the ground, Catron Allen. Um, I thought Al Auburn made Penn State's offensive line look much better than they had performed in the first two weeks, which which was discouraging. The, the bottom line is, is this is a must-win game, I think, for both coaches. I think it's for Eli Drinkowitz. I think it is for Brian Harson. Um, Auburn has the better players. It's going to be interesting to see who has the better team. But we, we, we can sit here and we can – talk about a variety of reasons why Auburn's not playing well. The bottom line is they don't have a quarterback, guys. I mean, I, I mean, they're not very good in the offensive line, and they don't have a quarterback to compensate for that. And it, it, you go into each and every game, and you're scared to death of what your quarterback's going to do. That's going to affect your, your, your play-calling duties. You're going to want to protect him. You're going to want to protect field position. Probably going to limit the chances that you're going to be willing to take in the downfield passing game. It just hamstrings you so bad um, when, you, when, you're, when you're coaching – to avoid a mistake that you fear the quarterback's going to make. And it feels like that's where Auburn's at right now. ESPN's Tom Lugabell with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. He has got, uh, he is tired of seeing Georgia Tech as old school. That's two this year. <laughs> um, so he's got Arizona State and Utah. Um, Arizona State, Utah. That is a late night ESPN2 kick, 930 out in the desert. That's where you'll see Lugabell this weekend. The, the the people at CBS tell me the biggest SEC games, Florida, Tennessee. I am more interested in Arkansas, Texas A&M. That is before you guys on ESPN. We've got a difference of opinion. Dunaway saw improvement in A&M's offense with Max Johnson. I thought it was pretty much the same thing. What did a trained eye like you see? He was 10 for 20. <laughs> I mean, uh, 140 I think statistically, yards. yeah, statistically, we didn't see much difference. What I will say I did see, though, is I, I felt like I saw more decisiveness out of Max Johnson. I thought he played faster. 
I thought he played with more of a belief in himself and in what the offense could do. Doesn't mean he was overly productive, but there seemed to be more of a sense of urgency with him under center. And listen, at the end of the day, if you're a Texas A&M fan, the most important thing that you have to take away from that game is that your kids showed up and they had some pride, right? And it mattered to them. They were embarrassed and they corrected it. They found a way to win a game. Obviously, they had home field advantage. Um, Miami did not play very well. Terrible game management opportunities there uh, on the Miami sideline. They don't seem to have any go-to playmakers for what is a very, very talented quarterback in Tyler Van Dyke. So I, I was impressed with, with Texas A&M being able to answer the toll, being able to show up, not feel bad for themselves, not feel sorry for themselves all week, and actually prove that the week before may have been a fluke. So Arkansas did struggle with Missouri State, Luganville, and maybe that was just a look-ahead situation because they found a way yeah. to win that game. And, you know, watching them against Cincinnati, watching them against South Carolina, they're really physical. I think we would all agree K.J. Jefferson's the better quarterback. This just uh, – I, I, I can't get a feel on this game, though, because A&M's defense is really good. Yeah, A&M's defense is very good, but I look at this game similar to how I look at the outcome of the App State-Texas A&M game. You look at how Texas A&M lost, A&M lost to App State. They got their butts whipped up front. I mean, uh, A&M had their way with Texas – excuse me, App State had their way with, with Texas A&M both offensively and defensively up front, and I think Arkansas is a team that's capable of doing the exact same thing. So now the quarterback play is going to be at even more of a premium for Texas A&M. Because if Arkansas's defensive front's capable of making the Aggies somewhat one-dimensional, the, the bulk of the load of the offense is going to go onto the shoulders of the quarterback. And what we've seen so far hasn't been overly impressive. Um, I will say this, and, and to the credit of Max Johnson and to that A&M offense, you, know, you had some of those suspensions, one of them being Evan Stewart. Uh, a lot of weapons on offense that you find out on Saturday morning are not going to be playing. You've practiced those guys in reps all week long, and now all of a sudden they're not there. They were able to weather that storm. Hopefully they don't deal with that type of personnel disadvantage this week, which could you know give that offense a, a bit of a boost. But you know, two things concern me um, about this game. Like I mentioned, one of them being uh, A&M being able to handle Arkansas's defensive front. And then on the flip side of that, how does AM handle a mobile athletic quarterback that's going to run the football? You know, you, you, you didn't get that out of Tyler Van Dyke. You didn't get that out of Chase Bryce at App State. Now the entire game plan changes because the guy holding the ball is a legitimate run threat on, on every snap. So instead of playing 11 on 10, which you've generally been playing, now you're truly playing 11 on 11. More with Billy Hoyle. I mean, uh, it's Tom Luganville with us, dressed as white men can't jump today on our, our conversation. <laughs> Uh, I haven't had a lot of sleep this week, boys. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working just to get to the, to the, to the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> um, hat turned around. I love it, man. We're talking to Lugs and we're talking college football. I can't remember where you were on Mississippi State and how great they were going to be this year or if you, where you thought they would end up. But what's your takeaway from Mississippi State and LSU this weekend, what you saw down in Death Valley? I think we all lost the old Luganville. Oh no! Did he hit the uh, did he hit the off button there? Yeah, he didn't like your reference. Yeah, from really? Shelton. Oh, I know you Googled out. that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> way, way to way to insult Luganville and make him hang up on us. What do you call it when somebody drops your Zoom connection? It's not hang up. That's a very old phrase. Yes. You don't even hang up on. I'm here. Him. He's back. He's back. Okay. He's back, baby. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. It was. I couldn't help it. It was. It was Will Muschamp looking <laughs> over my yeah. shoulder, peering down at me. Yeah. He's not happy with. With my hat being on sideways, <laughs> frontwards. Yeah, we'll go frontwards for the second half. Of the no, no, no. I like to turn around. I was complimenting you. I'm a big fan of that. Oh, one. okay. We're going to yes. go back. Yeah, we'll yeah, go yeah. right back. All so right, Mississippi State, LSU. I can't yeah. remember where you were on Mississippi State. What's your takeaway from, from that game down in Death Valley? Well, uh, number one, credit LSU for really cleaning up their act. I mean, they look like an entirely different football team from a preparation standpoint in that matchup than they did versus Florida State. Um, in, in week one. So I think they've done a really good job of, of cleaning things up. Um, once again, at the end of the day, um, when Mississippi State needs to have something to offset the passing game, they don't have it. And when you play a team that can really work you over up front, which LSU is capable of doing, um, it, it gets you off schedule, it gets you off platform. I, I thought that Mississippi State had some drops that were uncharacteristic to their nature. 
I think Will Rogers is really, really good. At the end of the day, I, I kind of just felt like every time Mississippi State made a mistake, LSU capitalized on it. And they were able to take advantage of it and started to gain momentum. And as they gained momentum, they gained confidence. And the game just got away uh, from, from Mississippi State. I, I liked Mississippi State preseason. I kind of felt like it was a shame that they were omitted from the AP Top 25 when you consider they had 17 starters back, the most experienced roster of anybody in the conference. I still think they are a top 25 caliber roster. And I think they'll sneak their way back in at some point if they don't just, you know, continue to stub their toe. But I think in this league, when you're playing really, really good people up front and you're going to be in the true air raid, it's always going to be difficult to be really, really good, particularly if you get yourself in the red zone. ESPN's Tom Lukeville on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. Sam Hartman back against Vandy was pretty good. Against Liberty, the yardage was good, but he didn't protect the ball very well. They get Clemson, yeah. who you've seen. It is a home game, gonna, I think a pretty sleepy environment, but whatever. Do they have anything at all for Clemson in that 11 a.m. kick? Yeah, no, I, I think that they do. And actually, I think that Wake will show up for a big game there. And again, Clemson will travel. So you'll have a pretty good atmosphere between the two fan bases. Um, listen, uh, Wake is pretty fortunate. You know, you mentioned Sam Hartman. He played well, but he also turned the ball over two times. The only difference was Wake, uh, excuse me, Liberty turned it over four times. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's the difference in the ball game. I think this is a scary game for Clemson. I know what they are on defense. I think they're legitimate on defense. I'd put them up there with any conversation anybody wants to have, particularly within the defensive front seven. But man, it's the offense that worries me, guys. And if this thing gets is close, it's close and it gets late into the second half, I really wonder, unless Clemson changes quarterbacks, if DJ could win this game outright if it got tight. Because we've seen him be very average against Georgia Tech in week one. Uh, Furman and, and Louisiana Tech were, you know, respectable numbers against subpar opponents, but nothing spectacular. And now he's going to go on the road against, I think, a you know really well-coached football team in Wake Forest. I, I think this game is going to be a lot closer than people think it is. And I get concerned about DJ in a tight game. Uh, speaking of well-coached, a game nobody's really talking about that is so intriguing and nobody will see it because it's on the Pac-12 network, 8.30 Central <laughs> Time, USC goes to yeah. Corvallis. I'm scared to death for the Trojans. Everybody's hyping them up. They're saying they're a playoff team. They're scoring over 50 points per game. Caleb Williams has been incredible. But that defense is still giving up a lot of rushing yards, over six yards per carry. And I watched this game last year. I saw Oregon State go for over 300 yards on the ground. Jonathan Smith is a great coach. This is a tough spot for USC. Big spot for USC. And keep in mind, this is just a run of that's going to include Washington State, who's been surprisingly productive. You talk about Oregon State, who I think is woefully undervalued. And then you're going to have Utah as well. With Arizona State snuck in there, we don't know what's going to happen with the Sun Devils. Listen, the bottom line is the only reason that SC is compensating for these defensive run game numbers is they have created 10 turnovers on defense in three weeks against two teams that were horrendous in Rice and Stanford and a team in Fresno State that ran the football effectively, but Jake Hayner got hurt and, and they, were out, they were outclassed with USC skills. So what we're seeing from offense, I think, is, is to be expected with – the transfer portal additions and what Lincoln Riley was hoping to do. But I, I think their, their defensive woes have been masked significantly by the turnovers and the amount of series they've been able to give back to their offense. And so when will we know if SC is for real? It's going to start this weekend. I truly believe that because if somebody's capable of lining up and running the ball at SC and doesn't give SC gifts, doesn't give them the turnover and an extra series here and there, then SC is going to be in for a dogfight because they're just, I don't think they're good enough up front. You're Matt Campbell. Do you, do you stay at Iowa State or do you take the Nebraska job if it's offered? Oh, man. Um, I think at this stage with Matt Campbell and what he's done with the Iowa State program, sometimes you get to a point where you say, can anything more be done with it than what we've done? And that maybe it's time to move on to the next adventure. The problem is, is I don't know if the next adventure is a better job than the one he currently has. It has more resources. It's got more financial structure to be able to do the things that you'd ultimately like to do to compete against the big boys. But aside from that, you don't have access to the caliber of player that people are expecting you to sign and, and, and compete with the powers in college football. I just don't, 
I don't think it's a great job right now. And, and when I say that, people say, well, what are you talking about? They have this, they have that, they have this, they have that. I said, okay, well, go ask every prominent coach that's at a top five, top 10 job right now if they would leave their job and take the Nebraska job. I can't list one. Yeah. Would Ryan Day leave Ohio State to go to Nebraska? No. no. Is Dabble leaving Clemson to go to Nebraska? No. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, Mark Stoops wouldn't leave Kentucky to go to Nebraska. Heck no. Yeah. He's got a much better job at Kentucky, a much better job. Yeah. And, um, and so I think that that's a, a legitimate question to ask, and it is very, very real. You know, I, I do think Lance Leipold is the ideal fit there. Um, I, I, I think he's a special football coach. And then, of course, are there going to be people that are interested in it? Yeah. The question then becomes, are they the type of people that the Nebraska fan base would say, oh, yeah, that's good enough for us? Because it's not going to be a top 10 coach at a top 10 program right now. All right, he is ESPN's Tom Lugaville. You can see him 9.30 ESPN2, Utah at Arizona State, the first game uh, after the firing of Herm Edwards on Saturday night, Utah at Arizona State. Lugs, enjoy the desert. Thank you for the time. Will do. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. All right, buddy, you too. ESPN's Tom Lugaville with us each week on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. <laughs>